Hey everybody and welcome back to the All Men. My name is Max Haddad. I'm your host. And uh, yeah, this is the All Moments Eternally Nice podcast, a podcast where as of a month ago or whatever, we take two articles, one from a conservative news source, one from a more left-leaning news source, and we talk about them, my hope being that I can be your gray area. Why? Because I don't know shit and I have to figure it out out loud. Uh, I'm not much into the news. I am way happier when I don't know what's going on anywhere, but I don't think... I think I'm too old to feel like ignorance is bliss. So sorry if you can hear my dog shaking. Uh, Yeah, so this is also a podcast about stand-up comedy, if that's something that you'd like. If you like inside baseball and stand-up, what it's like to be a comedian. And uh, the point is entertainment. (laughs) It's not political. If this is something that you think you'd be interested in, consider subscribing, leaving a like. Also, I'm going to say right at the beginning that um, I am probably going to end up using Fiverr to find a band or an audio person, I don't editor to uh, help me with the intro song. Right now we had a placeholder for 40 weeks. We got another placeholder. I think I do like it, but it's a placeholder and I need help uh, with a song idea that I have. So if you know how to uh, create music or edit audio really well, Uh, Let me know in the comments and I will get in touch with you somehow. So anyways, first 20 minutes about me. A bunch of shows this week. The shows were good. Uh, Not all of them were good though. I have done, I don't know, in the last, what, like three months, I'll say I've done like 50 shows, something like that. And um, maybe not that much. I don't care what the numbers are. Just know that they've all been great, except for I did have one really bad show. I did have a really bad show this week. I don't bomb as often as I used to, but boy, when I do, does it fucking suck. It doesn't feel good. I made some serious mistakes. I made some serious mistakes that I, in the set, that I know not to make. That's what pissed me off. That's what actually was upsetting about it. There's times when I'll tell a joke and it doesn't get a good response. That's normal. That's like how you develop material. You know, and, and, and often when I, if I tell a joke and it doesn't go well and I just feel like, okay... I didn't say it the right way. It's not even that it's not funny. It's that it's funny to me. I just didn't communicate why it's funny to them, you know? But this fucking, this show was bad. I had every opportunity to have a good time. And I just, you know, like I should have turned right. uh, And that's on your screen. It's left. I should have turned right. And on, uh, and, and instead I went left. Like just every, every time. Like I... I alienated audience members. I my crowd work fucking stunk. Uh, I called the club I was at racist. Like there was just there was just so many, and like actually all of the stuff that I did and uh, and a different context would have been funny. The audience would have liked it, but during this show, I just set everything up wrong. I just set everything up wrong. I came out like an asshole, and sometimes I do come off like kind of a dick on stage. And it's not. I'm not really trying to be a cool guy. But sometimes you have to like insist on something like you're saying something and the audience might not like it. So you have to be like, no, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying this, whether you are comfortable with it or not, I promise you it's funny. So just listen. Um, But I like jumped too quickly to being aggressive and like a dick before I had been funny enough. Like they didn't trust me to be a funny comedian. So all they saw was this stranger. They don't know who I am. I'm certainly not famous. They didn't know who I was being an asshole. And so like for the rest of the set, and it was not a long set either. It was only 10 minutes. So I didn't, I just was in a hole for the whole time. You know, I think if I was better, I could probably figure out how to get out of that quicker. Uh, But basically I came out, acted like an asshole. They decided I was an asshole. And so for 10 minutes, I just was that to them. So it was rough. It took me a few days to feel better. Luckily I had a show the next night and I did really well. So I just cleared the air. That's the thing. Like I used to, when I used to bomb, I would not necessarily take time off on purpose. Like if I had had a show I was booked on, I would do it, but I just wasn't getting booked on as many shows. So I would kind of have to sit with those feelings for a week or whatever. Luckily I had one the next night and it did make me feel better. But I, you know, this is sort of also a podcast about like feeling good, getting healthier, whatever. Um, whatever, as though that's not horribly important, but, uh, but I insisted immediately as soon as I got off stage, uh, that bad show, 
like I have to turn this failure into a win. So I, I have, you know, took notes on the set, what went wrong. Um, you know, I've got the audio recorded. I haven't gotten the courage to listen to it yet, but I swear I will to try to learn from it. You know, like some comedians will say and comedians that are more established than me, that's for sure. will say you don't learn anything from doing well, which I don't think that's true. I think comedy is very Pavlovian. Like you're trained by audience response to know which direction to go sort of. So when you're doing well, it reinforces certain behaviors. Like when I do this, it's funny. So I'll probably, there's a greater chance that I'll do that in the future. Um, so I do think you can learn from good shows, but I, I definitely think you learn. I don't want to say harder lessons. I don't know. You learn more painful lessons from when shit does not go well. Uh, and it, and it didn't, it did not go well. It was, yeah, it was comedy is very up and down. That's how it goes. It makes you feel great about yourself and then it humbles you. I was humbled. I deserved it. It was rough. It was not great. Uh, anyways, so that's kind of been the story of this week is that I was playing recovery after, after that set. Are you vaping? More than anything, it's a podcast about getting your children addicted to nicotine. So please make sure that your children, no matter what age they are, are, are consuming nicotine in some way. Uh, but I started hosting this, um, this open mic on, uh, every other weekend where I live. And I, I gotta be honest, I'm not having fun with it. I'm glad to be doing it. I'll say that I'm grateful for the opportunity that the club is giving me to host this thing. I don't have a lot of show production experience, so I do need it. Um, but the format for the show, I didn't really choose. And, uh, the club owner chose it and I respect the club owner. I like the club owner. He's a comedian, but the idea for this this open mic is that there's six spots. There's 12 total spots, six for club regulars and paid professionals and six for like people that want to come to the club and tr just do the open mic. So they might be comedians in the area, but they're not, they don't regularly perform at this club. And so what's frustrating is I'm a little limited in, in the way that I can promote this open mic because if you're not a club regular, the owner would like me to have you bring two people. It's called a bringer show. I never thought I would be hosting or producing a bringer show. It would never be my first choice to make people bring audience members, especially because there's a ticket price. They have to, it's only five bucks. Who cares? And they do, there's no item minimum. A lot of shows that are bringers will have an item minimum where you have to buy two drinks or whatever. You don't have to do that. You just have to buy the $5 ticket, but the, I get it. The club in order, you know, it's got, if it's going to be open, it wants to make money. The owner wants it to make money. That makes sense. That it's, it is a, a business. I get that. But if you're not a regular, you have to bring two people, which is not very many people. A lot of bringer shows will have you bring five or I've heard of 10, which is crazy. I don't know 10 people, especially 10 non-comics, but the regulars of this club don't want to come to the open mic. And I think I know why it's because it's brand new and because there's no audience for it. You know, and open mics and that where I live and I'm basically everywhere don't have audiences anyways, you know, you might find an audience in a metropolitan city at an open mic, maybe like, and when I lived in New York, you certainly weren't going to find, um, an audience at an open mic, but you know, if I guess I'm counting, like, let's say like the comedy seller, like their showcases where comedians are working on new material. In my opinion, that's almost like an open mic in some ways. And you're going to have an audience there because it's a trendy place to be. But like, you know, where the fuck I live, you're not going to have, nobody's going to come to an open mic on a Sunday. Maybe a few people, maybe. If there are five audience members, that is great, in my opinion. Like, Wilf, you can practice material. You can try to figure it out with five people. It's not ideal, but you can do it. Um, but the regulars don't want to come out because it's new and there's not an audience. And maybe they feel like it's a waste of time. It hurts my feelings a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Uh, cause if they had a new show, I would go to it, but they don't owe me anything. They, they really don't. Do they owe the club anything? I'll leave that between them and the owner. I think a lot of them do, but Hey, um, I said, I'd leave it between them and the owner. And then I literally said, yes, but 
it's frustrating because you know they are the, they would be the audience obviously they would be the performers but they would also be the audience for the other comedians and they don't want to come out because whatever it's not worth their time they could go to a different thing on sunday that's fine they truly don't owe me anything but it's like you know we have these slots uh, set aside for them uh if they're not going to come out fuck them you know like let me open this up to more people let me promote it in a different way because they support the club when it benefits them. But if they're not going to support it when it's a struggle, you know, like when it's easy, you know, there's going to be an audience, you show up, sure. And I get it. If you're doing stand-up, you, there should be an audience. Like that's a no-brainer, okay? But I believe that this thing, I don't think I'll run it forever. First of all, I think I will hand it off to somebody else at some point, hopefully. But, you know, I believe that this open mic on Sundays can have an audience. There's nothing else within 45 minutes of where I live on a Sunday night that has live stand-up comedy so there's no reason why people shouldn't want to come out and watch this thing it just needs time and it needs people backing it and word of word of mouth is that the same word of mouth whatever no no nolly not right now bub good girl you gotta stay so um but it's just annoying because i feel like i'm spending a lot of time trying to get these regulars to come out it's like they don't want to fucking come out man they don't they don't want to be there on a Sunday, they want to relax, whatever it is, whatever they want to do is fine. I'm just saying, I think, you know, it's been a, a few, uh, a couple of times now where, where none of them have come out. Um, and I ask a week ahead of time and it's like, you know, if this keeps happening, it's fucking embarrassing to message 10 people and nobody, everybody has an excuse. Like nobody can make it. None of you have been able to make it. And one guy came out and I told him ahead of time, like, listen, he came out literally one guy came out a few weeks ago to one and I told him ahead of time, it's going to be very sparsely populated. Like it's going to be you, me, a couple other comics, maybe a few audience members. And there were a few audience members. Luckily it was productive. It was good. It went well for, a, it was the first one. And so I was glad that that happened. I felt like this is a good start. We can work from here. And, but I don't think he's going to come back and I don't blame him because it, it like, I feel like he did his part almost, you know, like come back in two months or whatever. But he's not going to come back because he probably does have better options on a Sunday. Like, no doubt. So I'm kind of, I'm being double humbled. I was humbled by that show this week. I'm being humbled by, by producing this open mic now. And, and it's okay. Like, I'm not saying I'm better than it. I just mean, uh, I don't know how to get fucking people in the seats. I don't, I'm not a producer. I'm a performer. That's what I like to do. I never want to be somebody that puts on shows i have no interest you know i'm helping a friend she's got a roast that she's putting on it's interesting it's like a, a roast of spotify playlists like i guess spot i don't listen to music on spotify but spotify i guess gives you like whatever your favorite artists or songs from the year at the end of the year and so they are going to get up and like roast each other anonymously and then try to guess who's playlist is who's something it's inter it's not just a roast i like roasts but it's in my opinion more interesting than even that so like i'm gonna go help her but it's not my thing like i'm happy to step in and help out a little bit but as far as like advertising and trying to get an audience out like that's i you know at one point my dad asked me like not recently this has been years ago but he's like what if we started a comedy club and i said no because i don't want to start a comedy club i have no interest in owning a comedy club and constantly producing shows every week. And that's not why I love stand-up comedy. I love the performance aspect of it. So it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm frustrated tonight because I sent out the message earlier today or yesterday. I sent out the message yesterday over Facebook to everybody and nobody's going to be there. And a few people I knew couldn't. There is one, one, the person who I'm helping with her roast, she's there every weekend that she can be. Uh, she can't be there this one, but it's, she's on another show. That's if you're booked on a show, don't come to my open mic. Go do what you need to do, please. But it's just annoying. It's annoying. It's annoying because I'll, sometimes in life, and this is a little self-pitying. I don't like to pity myself. But a lot of times I feel like there are things that I would do for people. And then I don't think they would do the same thing for me. And I don't think it's because they're bad people. It's because I think I'm too nice and I'm not complimenting myself, by the way. <laughs> I'm not saying everybody should be like me. I'm saying I should probably be a little bit more stoic. I should probably be a little bit more reserved in how I spend my energy, you know? Um, and I, it, I'm not perfect, but I do, I think, sometimes care too much about other people. 
Uh, I don't think I'll ever be the guy that like walks over people or, you know, manipulates people on purpose to, uh, to gain in this industry or anything like that. But like, I'm just thinking of, of all these people that are on this list of regulars that I send these invites out to. Uh, if any of them had a show that was new and they needed people in the seats and they asked me, I would say yes and I would be there. Um, no, if you've legitimately got shit to do, you've legitimately got shit to do. You know, I think a couple people on, on the list have other jobs and they probably do work. They're probably restaurant jobs and they actually work every Sunday night and there's nothing they can do about that. Not their fault. Uh, I mean, I guess it's arguably their fault, but they need the job and it's, I don't blame them. But it's just like really like nobody, nobody, nobody can make it. I don't know. It's it, it. You can hear probably in my voice that I'm annoyed. And I think I'm annoyed because uh, because of that comparison that I'm making between myself and other people. I'm like, if the shoe were on the other foot, if you were asking me for help, because that's what I'm asking them for, by the way. Maybe I need to word it differently. I'm kind of realizing as I say this out loud, maybe instead of saying, would anyone like a spot? I need to say, hey, the club needs your support for this open mic in order to get it started. Maybe they, because they are good people. All these people are good people. That's why they're regulars at the club because they're funny. But more importantly than that, this club gives people opportunities because they're hardworking, good people, right? Like if you've legitimately got what it takes to be funny, but maybe you're not quite there yet, but you're a hard worker and you're a good, kind person, then you will get regular work at this club. Uh, and all of these people, I think all of these people are funny, to be honest. I don't think, I can't think of anyone on the list that's not funny, but all of these people are at least hardworking, good people. So it's like, maybe they're just not understanding what I'm saying. Maybe I need to be more clear. Maybe I need to humble myself further and be like, hey, motherfuckers, I need your help. I already sent out the list. I'm gonna let it ride this week. If this week I get nobody, then the following one, which is going to fall in like New Year's and everybody's going to have an excuse for that for sure. Uh, maybe I'll just say, I need your fucking help. <laughs> Please come out to this. Please make this an open mic that people want to be at. Otherwise, I don't know what to do. It's almost time to get to the articles, but you know, I could take out an ad in the local newspaper. Here's the deal. If I could get real people as in non-comedians to come out to this open mic, comedians are going to flock to it because it's valuable stage time. The problem is you need an audience. That's not the problem. It's the best thing about comedy. You need an audience to do it. It's not like playing an instrument. It's not like painting or drawing or dancing. You have to have an audience. That is the only way to truly develop an act. So the comedians go where the audience is. If I can get an audience of non-comedians, then they'll fucking want to be on it. And then I want to be like, no, <laughs> that's the little kid in me. That's like, no, go fuck yourself. You weren't here when there was nobody. So you're not going to be here when there's somebody. Anyways, it doesn't matter. I'm just talking. My week's been good. Stand up has been great lately. Truly, even with that bomb this week, I learned so much from that bomb about where I'm at and what I still need to do. It's been great. It's just fucking, you know, um, Every now and then I come back to this, that I want to move, that I want to move to a different city because I'm just not in a hot spot. I'm not. And uh, I don't think that I would like move to New York or whatever. I love New York. I truly love to live. I lived there for a couple years, some of the best times of my life until I squandered it. <laughs> Personal stuff we're not going to get into. But uh, I would love to be back there, but I don't think I would go and just be like famous. That's not at all my expectation. My expectation is I would start back from square one fucking doing open mics for five years, probably whatever, getting booked on no shows, performing for only comedians. But at least I would feel like I was in a living, breathing city because just where I live is just very, it's very stale. Even though I, I feel more active in the comedy scene here than I felt ever. And I've done stand up in this state and city off and on for 10 years. I feel more part of it than I ever have. And it just feels dead. That's just what it feels like to me. It feels dead. There's shows, but it's just, it's just like, fuck. It's so hard to get people to come see comedy here if it's not at a comedy club. And even sometimes at a comedy club, it's hard unless you're a famous, you know, comic or actor that does comedy or YouTuber, God forbid, um, which I'm so 
trying to not become, but then I asked you at the beginning of the video to like the fucking thing. That hurts my soul, by the way. It hurts to ask you to like the video, but I'm supposed to do that. It's called a call to action. Anyways, today's article, one of t article one today, this is on MSNBC. I didn't realize it was going to be a bipartisan article, but I decided on it and we're going with it. The title of the article is Republicans are trying harder than ever to suppress the youth vote. All right. And I know my face is blue when I have the, the website open, but you know, what the fuck am I going to do? The party, often behind closed doors, is taking a page out of the anti-democracy playbook. I don't know if that's a, a real playbook. Uh, there's a picture here of a young white guy filling out a survey from a young black girl. I don't know if it's real or not. Kobe Rich, 20, a junior at the University of Pennsylvania, helps Chelsea Perry, 30, an MBA student at the Wharton School of Business, register to vote during a voter drive on campus in Philadelphia in 2022. Oh, no, so she's actually filling out something. Okay. By Victor Shi, S-H-I, don't know how to pronounce that. As recent elections have shown, Republicans are struggling on the national, state, and local levels. Are they? In 2020, Donald Trump, by the way, I'm going to say this for those that might be new. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I don't like either party. <laughs> That's where I stand. I think both parties are full of shit. And I feel that way. I felt that way as a kid. And now I have a slightly more uh, rich, matured opinion. But I basically still feel that way. I just, I feel like they might be lying from different places, but they're still lying. And I think in both cases, they think we're dumb. In 2020, Donald Trump became the first incumbent president who lost re-election since 1992. The red wave so many Republicans predicted for the 2022 midterm elections never materialized. And let me say this, as far as Republicans struggling on the national, state, and local levels, from where I'm sitting as somebody who does not want this to happen, I think Trump's going to be president again. Is Trump funny uh, in um, debate? Yeah, because he makes these fucking geeks look really stupid. Uh, even though I think he's just lying. He's just saying whatever he needs to say to make the person look bad. He's good at doing that. He's good at being a bad person. He's good enough at being a bad person that he can make decent or average people look like shit. I don't I actually don't even know if they're decent or average people, but these people that are, if you're going to play by the rules, Trump is going to make you look like a joke. So from where I'm sitting as somebody who, who thinks that Trump is not a good president, um, I think he's going to win. I'd hate to say that on a public platform because this is going to be found in the future. Hopefully, hopefully I'm famous enough at some point, not even famous, but successful enough that people want to hear what I had to say 10 years ago. They're going to be like, he fucking said Trump was going to win. It's his fault. Uh, I just think that I don't trust America right now to not reelect him. Um, and I know some of you might be Trump supporters. And if you are, I want to also say I fucking get it because Biden sucks ass. <laughs> so... If you think Trump is better than Biden, I don't even know if I disagree. In 2020, Donald Trump became the first incumbent president who lost re-election since 1992. The red wave so many Republicans predicted for the 2022 midterm, make sure I'm recording, that would suck, uh, elections never materialized. This year, including November's off-year elections, Republicans faced more defeats up and down the ballot even in states and districts historically thought of as favoring Republicans. Remember, this is on MSNBC, which is left-leaning in a pretty pretty severe way. Uh, and this might be confirmation bias. They might be hammering home how much Republicans are losing just to uh, make Democrats feel better and, and hopefully to convince people that they want to be on the winning side. Um, so, you know, ho hopefully, as in hopefully from their opinion, not where I'm sitting. So, the youth vote continues to play a major role in Democrats' electoral success. A recent analysis found that Dem all this is going to be linked, by the way. This uh, article and the next will be linked in the description of the video if you want to look at any of this. The youth vote continues to play a major role, blah, blah, blah. A recent analysis found that Democrats maintain a 21-point advantage over Republicans with young voters. I heard when I was uh, a young AA member, AA is a cult, don't go, um, that it was some, it's some French quote translated and I'm not, I'm going to have to paraphrase it, but basically it was, if you are young and not a Democrat, you have no passion. And if you're old and not a Republican, you have no wisdom. That's what I was told. And I will say, as I've gotten older, I've started to lean more towards uh, the conservative side of things than when I was a 15 year old or whatever. Um, I don't think it's because of that quote. I don't necessarily even think that quote is correct, but uh, because I think you could probably argue that Democrats, 
are maybe the more compassionate of the two parties. And I think as you age, a lot of times you become more compassionate, more empathetic. But it can go both directions. You can age and you can become fucking, you know, angry and not want to look out for other people. I'm very broke, you know. So when I come at things conservatively, it's typically from a fiscal point of view, which makes me look uh, a little jaded and um, unempathetic sometimes. The GOP understands this problem well, talking about the 21-point advantage Democrats have over Republicans with young voters. As former Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker admitted earlier this year on Fox News, young people are the problem, and Republicans must turn it around if they are going to win again. But Republicans are not turning it around. Despite holding the majority in the House, the GOP isn't doing anything to address young people's most specific concerns, whether it's gun violence, climate change, or student loans. Instead, the party, often behind closed doors, is taking a page out of the anti-democracy playbook. That is, Republicans are currently waging a sustained, intense, and targeted war to disenfranchise young people in 2024. Um, if this is happening... I think Democrats would probably do the same thing. Voter suppression is, of course, uh, a well-trodden strategy for the GOP. The party continues to target racial and ethnic minorities like Black and Hispanic Americans through tactics like gerrymandering, enacting stricter voter ID requirements, and restricting early voting options. So it's no surprise that as young voters turn out at robust levels, Republicans are doing more than ever to block me and my fellow students from casting our ballots in 2024. Okay, so apparently Victor Xi was that, yeah, is a young person. It's weird to be reading a news article and all of, all of a sudden hear me. I'm like, who the fuck is me? This is an opinion article, by the way. This is not necessarily a fucking, you know, I mean, when, when was the last time news was factual? You know what I mean? So we are reading somebody's opinion. One chilling instance that highlights the depth of the GOP's commitment came from Cleta Mitchell. Cleta. Cleta? How the fuck do you... C-L-E-T-A. It's like... Uh, it's like a name you would give to a body part. A conservative lawyer who helped Donald Trump in his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Uh, and as far as that goes, I think Trump is just a sore loser. I, well, first of all, I think Trump is probably pretty used to settling things in court. So to him, like losing is like, well, I'll fix that in court. But also, uh, again, like, is he a, a deeply insecure, short-dicked man? Yeah. So... Does, did he want to, you know, I, you didn't beat me, you cheated. Like, you know, come on. At a, large at a large Republican donor retreat earlier this year, Mitchell not only decried the ease of voting on college campuses. Yeah, the ease of voting. Oh, it's too easy to vote. Voting should be hard. <laughs> what? but detailed an elaborate 50-page plan to establish election integrity task forces, which, you know, I don't believe in the veracity of their, their claim, but like, yeah, I don't think voting should be something you can do without an ID. Mitchell's plans are being reflected in legislation across the country. A study from the Voting Rights Lab reveals that at least 15 states have introduced or enacted legislation that would make it harder or even illegal for students to use their college ID to vote in elections. Yeah, fuck them, dude. I mean, here, I understand. <laughs> I understand that Republicans might be trying to prevent people from voting that would be voting against them. And that's wrong. That shouldn't happen. But you know what? Fuck your college ID, dude. Use your driver's license. If you don't have a driver's license, get one issued from the state. I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't. I think you should fuck your college ID, dude. I don't care that you went to IUPUI. You should have an ID that's issued by the fucking government. No. I just think as far as like making it hard to vote, I don't think requiring a real ID from the government is making it hard to vote. I don't think being asked to like, I don't think being asked to do some, a step above the bare minimum is, is that big of a challenge. I don't, you know, if you had to pass a physical exam to vote, then I'd be like, well, not everybody can pass a physical exam. Not everybody can do 50 pushups or whatever, you know, then I'd be like, yeah, you're trying to like isolate people, but that they don't want you to use your college ID. Like, 
I mean, now, I think you should be able to use a temporary government ID. Okay, but the people that are accepting IDs at uh, ballot booths should be able to spot a fake, you know, that kind of thing too. As Republicans know better than anyone else, elections are won on the margin. If they can keep one young voter from voting, they know it can make or break the election. Not at all. If one vote made a difference in America, I would be a lot more motivated to vote. That's one of the most frustrating things about American politics is that somebody will get the popular vote and still lose. It's like, what the fuck is that? The Electoral College, which I've always been told is just to prevent um, dumb people from deciding who becomes president, clearly didn't work. Uh, and as Republicans have demonstrated, they will not back down from their sustained attacks on voting rights, whether they're on black voters or on young voters, because that is the only way for them to win elections. They will quite literally do anything to achieve and maintain power, even if it means undermining the fabric of democracy, the ability to vote. I don't know if um, saying you can't use your college ID to vote is undermining the fabric of democracy. I don't think the fabric of democracy is threaded with college IDs. I don't. I think that's I think you're I think you're being a baby about it. Against this backdrop, it is critical for voters not to become apathetic or tap, tap out. Hey, you know what? If you would become apathetic and tap out on a presidential election because they said you have to go to the BMV, maybe you don't care enough to vote. Maybe, maybe you're not ready. <laughs> Sorry, you had last time I went to the BMV. You know the old joke about how fucking hard the BMV is to deal with it. It takes hours and hours. Every time I've been there, I've been there maybe three times in the last six months. It took me like 25 minutes. It probably is worse uh, around election time. Sure. But like if you show up with your college ID, they say, sorry, you can't use that. First of all, you should have known ahead of time. But I bet before the end of the voting day, you could still go and get another ID. I just, yeah, if, if you're so dejected because you can't use your college ID that you are now apathetic, I don't know if I want somebody that fickle deciding who's president. You're not emotionally stable enough to decide who should lead the fucking free world. I know a lot of you don't live in America. So there's a lot, there's a lot of free parts of the world. Not all of them are the United States. Don't become apathetic or tap out. Instead, organizers, activists, and media must highlight how Republicans are undermining voting rights for racial and ethnic groups and young people. Put simply, 2024 will be a binary choice between a party that believes in democracy and a party that does not believe in democracy. <clears throat> and voters and the media must feel that threat and act with urgency that this moment demands. And it's equally crucial to support... And I, All right, let me say this too. I feel like I sound like a crotchety old man right now. When I'm like, you can't use your fucking college ID? Deal with it, little kid. Go get a real ID. But as I'm reading this, again, not identifying as a Republican, I feel like I see how somebody who's 62 would read this and be like, God, you people are fucking whiny. Like, that's how I feel. I feel like you're whining. You're whining. Go get a real ID. Even if, even if, now I do agree with what they're saying. Okay. In that if, if Republicans are trying to, to block votes, it should motivate you even more to get your fucking vote in. You know what I mean? If somebody, if I want to do something and somebody tells me I can't do it, I'm like, oh, now I want to do it three times as much. That's what I hope young people would take from any bullshit that the Republicans are doing, young people and black people and Hispanic people, all that, any minority, is that if somebody's trying to take your freedom from you to participate in the politics of the country you live in, you should be so fucking amped up that there's nobody that's going to stop you. Get 10 IDs, dude. That's what I would get. I'd show up with, if they're telling me I can't use this ID and that, I'm going to show up with so many fucking IDs, dude. And it's equally crucial to support efforts to register young people to vote. When those who do not vote are asked why, many young people cite how confusing the political process is. Luckily, and I agree with that, it is confusing as fuck. Luckily, every, it's, well, it's not, I don't know. It's not super confusing, but it's, there are parts of it that are like, seriously? I think it's demoralizing. I think the Electoral College is demoralizing. Everybody in my age group, early 30s, my, some of my closest friends, when I talk to them, none of them are like, I love the Electoral College. It always makes them feel like their vote doesn't count. Now, I live in a state that's predominantly always, always votes one way. So when I vote, if I'm to vote against the party that normally wins here, 
it does feel like my my vote is wasted. Uh, if there was a total vote and like popular vote decided, then I would feel like my vote counted because it's being counted as a country. But it, the way that the electoral electoral uh, college um, decides things, it does make you feel like your vote doesn't count. Luckily, every parent and every person who knows a young person in their life can make a difference by helping them register, make time to vote, and navigate the complex electoral realities of not just national ele elections, but state and local elections too. As my government teacher often told me and my peers, young people should embrace the civics lifestyle. And that happens by talking to young people and showing them how they too can make a difference. Republicans know they are losing. I don't think they know that. I think you're too confident. And I think last time Democrats were too fucking confident, they lost. That's what I think. Last time they were cocky, like, <laughs> Republican, no, Trump's going to get elected? No fucking way. They got smoked. And then it was fun to watch them cry the next day. As somebody who didn't want Trump to win. I like it when any smug person gets beat. That feels great. When any Now, if somebody's an underdog and they turn into a confident winner, that I don't want them to lose. If somebody is really smug and elitist and then they get shown what the reality of their situation is and they get fucked up, I'm all for that. You know, if you see two boxers and one of them thinks he doesn't need to train, he's going to win no problem. And the other person busts their ass, doesn't say shit, doesn't talk shit, just shows up and throws punches and they win. Yeah, it fucking, the, you know. So again, this is like, I'm glad that this is apparently written by a young person. I do think it's good that young people are involved in, in voting and politics. I wish I had been more involved when I was younger. Truly, I do. Because, I, you know, I just was, I had way too many mental health issues. You didn't want me voting for president. Trust me. The only president I was going to vote for was whatever president was going to legalize heroin. So, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad of that. But like, as far as saying Republicans are losing and they know it. I've never felt more like Republicans are about to win. Our president can barely fucking walk across a room. I feel like any, my experience, and I could be wrong because I don't know like the literal truths of this, but I feel like whenever, um, first of all, I think Trump losing set a precedent that we don't have to reelect somebody. I mean, I know that it happened before, but that's a recent precedent that we you can certainly kick somebody out after but at four years instead of eight but um you know you get a democrat in the, in the political or presidential office and then you get a republican it's just back and forth and back and forth because what happens is one party's doing everything and we feel like they're fucking everything up so we're like well fuck that somebody else take over and then they take over and we're happy for a month and then we're bummed for the rest of this you know four to eight years and we're like well, we'll let the other party take over again it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and people are horribly unhappy about biden democrats are my sister, who is one of the most liberal people I know, can't stand Biden. And a lot of it has, I mean, I'm a Palestinian, guys. I'm half Palestinian. I don't love his politics. <laughs> He's so pro-Israel, it's insane. He's more pro-Israel than Israelis are. Like, it's wild, you know? I don't know enough to speak on this, but just, you know, America stepping in and be like, uh -uh, no ceasefire, please. Keep shelling Gaza, you know? I'm not voting for Biden. I'm not going to vote for Trump, but I'm not voting for Biden. So who the fuck else am I going to vote for? You know, there's just so many people that don't want him. I don't know. What was I saying? Oh, all I was saying is last time that the Democrats got real cocky about who was going to be in office because Dave Chappelle has an awesome joke about this. Look up his joke about, um, there's not really a way to say it nicely. Look up Dave Chappelle's joke about eating out Hillary Clinton and then she farts in your face. That's what happened. Hillary Clinton should have won. We should have had a female president for the first time. That would have been very cool. I'm not saying she's who I would pick necessarily, but yeah, I think it's time that we have a female president. Uh, but, you know, like... Uh, last time we thought she was, there's no way she could lose. And they were walking around like there's fuck trying. He's a, he's a TV celebrity. He's a businessman. He's not going to win. They got stomped. So I, that's what it, that's what it reads to me. Anyways, I get angry. I just get angry because there's no collaboration between parties anymore. It's always this party's doing that. And that party's doing that. And I've just said a bunch of shit like that. 
But there's so many people in the middle. I said this is not a political podcast. Clearly, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I, I, apparently, I don't know what political means. But there's so many people in the middle that are frustrated by both parties. And they would feel better represented if Democrats and Republicans could figure out some way to communicate. That would be awesome. Okay, so the next article I think is going to be not like that. Yes, okay. Fox News finally covering something that's important. Doritos unveils not-so-cheese flavored booze that cost $65 a bottle. This is the first spirit to match the flavor profile of Doritos product. Of a Doritos product, I think they meant. This is by Daniela Genovese. Genovese? G-E-N-O-V-E-S-E. -E -E. I've heard that. Genovese? Genovese? Daniela Genovese. PepsiCo and custom spirits maker Empirical Tea teaming up, are teaming up to launch a new spirit that tastes like a Doritos nacho cheese chip. Um, can you think of anything worse? The Empirical Doritos nacho cheese vacuum distilled spirit is described as capturing all the indulgent flavors of your favorite nacho cheese in liquid form. Let me raise this up here raise my hand real quick for those of you that are just listening uh if you want to enjoy nacho cheese in liquid form might i suggest you do it um by eating nacho cheese because that's what nacho cheese is it's liquid cheese uh also like you know um first thing i'm thinking when i read this is i bet you the flavor that comes out uh more strongly than any of the indulgent flavors of my favorite nacho cheese chip is the fucking vodka <laughs> that's in it <laughs> If you want to eat nacho cheese, if you want the flavor, the indulgent flavor, has anybody ever eaten a Dorito and been like, I'm indulging right now? Not at all. Like you're fucking sitting in a tropical island and you've got this whole feast in front of you that's been cooked by the natives. I'm feeling, if I'm eating Doritos, I'm feeling sad. Even though they are, good, it's a good chip, I will say. I'm more of a Cool Ranch guy. Nacho cheese is great. Uh, you know, if you want to... If you want that flavor, like, um, don't, don't drink nacho cheese flavored vodka, eat nacho cheese Doritos, I, you know, but obviously this is like a part, this is to bring to a party and be like, look how fucking dumb I am. You know, one of those things where you show up a gag gift, basically you give this to your pothead friend. That's what this is for. <sighs> For the man that already has three bongs, you get him a bottle of Doritos vodka. The drink, which goes on pre-order Wednesday, is a new marketing ploy aimed at Doritos fans. It also marks the first ever spirit based entirely around the flavor of first ever. I think you can just go ahead and jump to only. Uh, around the flavor of a Doritos product. It will be available next month online and in select stores in the New York and California markets. Lucky, lucky markets. Every now and then where I live, you occasionally get a test product, but I do remember when I lived in New York, you would see some fucking insane flavors for chips and stuff because they would test. It would be like a test market. They would just try new products out there. Lucky bastards getting to have some of that mm, yummy nacho cheese vodka. A 750 milliliter bottle will cost $65. Uh, oh my God. Are you fucking kidding me? This article is only like, it's already done. You don't have more to say about nacho cheese vodka. Um, all right. So this type of collaboration isn't new. In 2022, Kellogg Co. partnered with Sugarlands Distilling Co. to create an alcoholic eggnog. The eggnog Appalachian Sip and Cream, that actually sounds good, was described as a rum-based liqueur with cinnamon and nutmeg flavor notes. That same year, Arby's also released a smoked bourbon drink that resembled its smoked brisket sandwich. Oof. That sounds better than nacho cheese, though. A year earlier, the company collaborated to make a crinkle. Those of you that live in Norway and, and Finland, and you have got to be like saying, how American can you be, right? A year earlier, the, uh, the company, I, this is the world has to look at us and be, be like, this is their literally homeless starving people in their country and they're doing this a year earlier the company collaborated to make a crinkle fry vodka which matched the flavor profile of its signature curly and crinkle fries that's the end of the article well let's read some of the comments central scrutinizer says ha 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 to each their own what would the mixer for this be that's a really good question mountain dew code red what would a mixer be no ooh, mountain dew uh, maybe what would it get ew what would a good mixer be for nacho cheese? 
first of all, I, I really don't drink. If I, Back when I did drink, when I was much younger, it was always just about getting fucked up. So I would drink bottom shelf vodka at room temperature, at, typically out of the, the, the um, trunk of a Toyota Camry. That was my favorite. Pull over, pop the trunk, have a little sip. Um, so I was never a mixer guy, maybe a chaser guy. And I definitely, I get the joke, Mountain Dew Code Red, haha, ha, but what would actually taste good with nacho cheese vodka? Hawaiian punch is coming to mind for some reason. But when I was really young, I was trying to be a cool guy at a party. I was probably like 14 and uh, somebody had, I know there was no way I was that young. I was probably like 16 or 17. Somebody had a bunch of alcohol we were at their house the parents were gone whatever and i was trying to show everybody how much i could drink and they had hawaiian punch as like the chaser so i like mixed a bunch of hawaiian punch and vodka and chugged a bunch of glasses like that and i was and they were like how do you do it and i was like you just drink it and then stop being a bitch that's what i said thinking i was being like above it like a cool guy uh and then within 10 minutes i'm outside like explosively vomiting because I was so fucking sick. I had to leave the party. I felt so ashamed still. Uh, but for some reason, nacho cheese and like Hawaiian punch sounds good. Doritos, uh, Joe, the, Joe, the pedophile P H E D O P H I L E. I don't, what is a pedophile? No, that's just pedophile spelled wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully Joe has a better taste in food than lovers. Eminem, nothing beats the taste of one bourbon, one scotch, and one beer. All right, dude. Thanks for your fucking input. What does that have to do with this? Sure to be a big hit with street people. <laughs> Something both New York and California have plenty of. I like that they went with street people to be respectful, like don't call them hobos, while still encapsulating it within an insult. Something both New York and California have plenty of. Very true. Has New York improved its homelessness at all? Because it was rough when I was there. Uh, I don't think a $65 bottle of nacho cheese vodka is going to be popular with street people. I think they're probably going to stick to dark eyes and, and shit like that. Um... Great. Now, instead of your breath smelling like alcohol, it'll smell like sweaty tube socks. Fuck off, dude. Stupid ads on Fox. Uh, if I'm craving an adult beverage, it's certainly not going to be an overpriced frat party drink. It'll be a decent single malt scotch. I'll take Lagavulin or Lafroeg any day. I don't know how to say that. Bourbon, whiskey, or a nice full-bodied red. If I want Doritos, I'll buy a bag, but I certainly don't want them in liquid form. All right, Kalahu, you're taking this way too fucking seriously. Um, nobody asked also. It's cool that you drink scotch, but uh, you sound pretty gay. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. This is a joke. This is a, a clearly a joke. This is, yeah, you don't... You're not... Nobody's going to enjoy this. <laughs> It's not meant to be enjoyed. E even PepsiCo knows that this sucks. I don't think, I mean, like maybe a frat drink, maybe, but again, what do they do at frats? What's it called? Jungle juice? What do they call it when they pour like gin and vodka and fucking, they just pour all the alcohols together with maybe some like sugar and stuff. If somebody did that, like every hard liquor you can think of and whatever sodas they put in, whatever they do, and then came and somebody was trying to dump Doritos shit into it, I'd be like, no, 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 you're going to ruin the horrible drink we already made. You're going to, the the bottom shelf, as low quality as possible drink that we made, you're going to ruin it by adding that. I feel like that's something you have to drink on its own, right? You have to drink, I mean... If it tastes identical to Doritos, I think that does prove how chemically derived the Doritos flavor is. Like how not cheese that cheese flavor is. Because you know, a lot of flavors for chips and things like that are just powders. They're just chemical powders and you just sprinkle them on stuff. Like you can get sodas that are you know, bacon flavored. That's a classic ranch flavored, you know, like stuff like that. You can, you can get these custom sodas that are made. And it's always, it's made by a person in a white lab coat, you know, and that's, that's what Doritos is. Doritos is not like 
finely aged Parmesan shredded down, you know, small enough so that you can sprinkle it on a tortilla chip. And now that's a delicious nacho cheese chip. It's, it's horrible chemicals. Like what are the ingredients of nacho cheese Doritos? The first thing that came up is that Doritos launches nacho cheese flavored spirit. Ingredients. Corn, vegetable oil, sunflower, canola, intercorn oil, maltodextrin. Less than 2% of the following. Salt, cheddar cheese. Whey, monosodium glutamate. So monosodium glutamate is interesting. That's like a super savory. You guys have, I'm sure, heard of MSG before. But monosodium glutamate is... There's actually a lot more cheese ingredients in, uh, well, it's less than 2% of all of them, but there's more cheeses named in Doritos ingredients than I thought there would be. Uh, but MSG is like, it's, it's like super savory is what it is, basically. Like it's, it's umami, I think is what the Japanese call it. They might have coined the term for it, but it's, it's like, you know, you've got sweet and sour and different flavor profiles that you taste on different parts of your tongue. Umami is one that I think happens towards the back of the tongue. Insert joke about cum. But there's, uh, that's like the flavor profile. The, okay, MSG has that flavor profile like uh, exponentially so. So it basically hijacks your brain's uh, reward system. And so you see, you probably still see it, but you would see like no MSG added on like Chinese restaurants and things like that. Because people used to think it was bad for you. Apparently it's not bad for you, but what it causes is compulsive eating. So like it's very difficult for you to stop eating something with, M not very difficult, but it's harder to stop eating something that has MSG in it than something that doesn't. Like I was go, I had a bag of Cheez-Its and I was like fucking going crazy on them. Uh, and I was like, oh, I wonder. And I looked and I just, it does. It's got MS, even Cheez-Its have MSG in it because basically they figured out a way to get consumers to eat their product compulsively. Uh, thus, you know, like, you know, reducing the time in between purchases, that kind of thing is my, my dumbass theory on it. I think that's obvious. Of course, they want people to eat more of their shit. So they make it, you know, I don't know, basically abusable, turn it into a drug. You know, it doesn't like, it's not like it gets you high. It's just there's something that MSG does to the brain that makes it so you want to eat more and more of it. I'm not, I'm not informed enough. Well, sorry, the second article was a bust, but you know, I, we, I feel like that was still interesting. If you end up trying that Doritos drink, let me know, please. It sounds horrible. I don't, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't really drink and I'm definitely not going to like dip my toes back into the proverbial water with something that's nacho cheese flavored. But yeah, anyways, I hope you guys have a good week. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the amen. And yes, again, if you've made it to this point, thank you so much. You're a true fan. Uh, if you know how to fucking edit audio or make music, please let me know in the comments because I need help with the song. So take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.